Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you another inspiring true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Listen to the true dramatic story of an actual person who, because of his courage and achievement, is honored tonight on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Presented by our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Respectfully dedicated to men and women whose service, sacrifice, and devotion have made our own lives a little better, but about whom we know all too little. Today is Mother's Day, a day to honor her, to express our love and respect and admiration for her. To appropriately mark this day, the Hallmark Hall of Fame presents the story of the American mother whose love guided the growth and developed the character of the man who was first a great general and then a great president of the United States, George Washington. And in addition to the story of Mary Washington, we shall hear transcribed from New York, America's Mother of the Year. Now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card, and you'll find the card you want to send. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it, with the good taste you demand of anything that bears your signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you care enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture Young Bess, starring Gene Simmons, Stuart Granger, Deborah Carr, and Charles Lawton. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the first act of our Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is a story of quiet greatness, the chronicle of a mother who sought the background. But by her own splendid example, a judgment and faith raised five children, one of whom was destined to dominate the foreground of a new nation. The nation was our own United States of America. The mother, Mary Washington. <laughs> is 1833, May 7, 1833. The scene is Fredericksburg, Virginia, where the townspeople have gathered to hear a eulogy over a simple grave. The speaker is President Andrew Jackson. My fellow citizens, more than a century has passed since she to whom we paid tribute entered upon the active scenes of life. It is to her eternal credit that in that century she gave us George Washington. It is to our eternal discredit that the grave of Mary Washington has gone unmarked until this moment. She is 44 years dead, and our United States is 44 years young. Today, let us wipe away our own dishonor by honoring the mother who gave life to George Washington and inspired in him the qualities of leadership for which he is revered. 
The precepts of Mary Washington were reflected in every act of her son's life. Back across the years goes the tribute of President Jackson to Mary Washington. Back to her birth in 1706, to her marriage to Augustine Washington in 1730, to the birth of their five children. George, her eldest son, was 11 years old when his father died. Mother, a man does not weep, does he? Men weep, as women do. But tears are a selfish tribute, George. Selfish? Tears say, look at my grief. I am full of pity for myself. We shall miss your father, always, in deep personal ways. But we pay our tribute to him in grateful thanks because he lived, not because he died. If I were older, if I were a man... There is still time for you to become a man, my son. And when the time comes, your own mind will tell you first. Mary Washington must have found herself studying George as the weeks and months sped by, watching her son grow to young manhood the idol of his sister and younger brothers. His years of decision were ahead. Mary must have wondered what those decisions would be. I can't understand what's taking George so long. He said he had some small packing left to do. Packing? His boxes are already aboard the vessel. Has anyone explained to him that a midshipman's life is not a pleasure cruise? No one but you is qualified to explain that to him, Lawrence. Why don't you go to his room? You, his half-brother, and would be welcome, I'm sure. Where Mother might be in the way. I'll wait with you. You know, you've surprised me a great deal. Indeed, how? Oh, I know you're against George going to sea. I know you don't think he belongs in the English Navy. I've never said that, Lawrence. No, 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 no. You've never said it, but your silence has been eloquent. If you had said one word against it, George wouldn't be going. I, I think that must have taken a great courage. Courage is a big word. I've been silent because this is George's decision to make. It's part of being a mother, Lawrence. One of the hard parts. To know the right time to let go of the child's hand and let him walk on without you. Oh. George is 15. I can't think of him anymore as a boy. Well, I must say I envy George. He's fortunate to have such a mother. And to have you, Lawrence. You're his friend, companion, an older man for George to look to. I'm grateful for all you've done for him. Mm. Including securing the midshipman's warrant for him in the Royal Navy? Well, it's made him very happy that you would want him to follow your career, too. Well, George will be coming down soon. I'll wait in the carriage for him. You'll want these last moments alone with him. Hmm? Thank you, Lawrence. I bid you good morning, madam. I was about to call you, George. You've not much time before sailing, you know. I know, Mother. I, well, I, I gathered the books I wanted to take, and I found myself looking through them. Mm-hmm. I found this in an old copy book. It's in your hand, Mother. Remember when you wrote it? Well, I'm not sure, dear. What is it? Labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire, conscience. Oh, yes, I remember. <laughs> and here, Mother... In the Bible you gave me, you've written, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Chapter 5 of St. Matthew, verse 16. Where is he where, George? Mother, sit here by me. Well, Lawrence is waiting in the carriage, George. Mother, just now I've begun to understand. I think maybe I know what a conscience really is now. I think I understand the words from the Bible. I don't know if I can explain, but... Much of real knowledge is slow in coming, son. But once you really know and understand, it never leaves you. Remember when Father died, you told me that when the time came for me to be a man, my own mind would tell me? Yes, George, I remember. I think that time has come, Mother. I've decided not to go to sea. Well, you, you must be very sure, George. 
You owe it to yourself and to Lawrence. Well, Lawrence will understand. It is my decision to make, and I've made it. Let me look at you. Yes, Mother? It is a subtle change, but it is there. I look at my boy, and suddenly there he is, a man. A man's place is in his home, meeting his responsibilities. I want to be here, Mother, to help you so long as you need me. <laughs> tears, Mother? Yes, George. Selfish tears of joy. A 14-year-old boy decides against a career in the English Navy. And the future course of history changes. The Virginia colony thanks you, Mary Washington. The Continental Army to come thanks you for your early teachings of responsibility. Your own fine dedication to duty shaped and formed that decision that saw America gain its first great general and president, George Washington. In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Once again, spring, loveliest of seasons, has taken over the land. As Reginald Heber expressed it, spring unlocks the flowers and paints the laughing soil. It's no wonder that we Americans plan some of our happiest celebrations for May and June. Graduations, for instance, and bridal showers and traditional June weddings. Now, many of you will be shopping soon for the gifts you'll want to give on these occasions, and when you do, I'd like to suggest that you choose Hallmark gift papers to carry out the mood of each gift you select. You'll find a fresh spring collection of Hallmark gift papers with tags and seals to match at the fine stores where Hallmark cards are sold. There are graduation papers for boys or girls, feminine prints for shower gifts, and a sparkling array of wedding gift papers for everything from formal silverware to kitchen accessories. Remember, the care you take to give your gifts a personal, decorative touch will prove your loving thoughtfulness instantly. So look for the gift wrappings with the hallmark and crown on the package, the symbol that means you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Mary Washington. Mary Washington's friends and neighbors are gathered at her simple grave. And the words of President Andrew Jackson continue to echo their eulogy across the Virginia countryside. Some of you are contemporaries of Mary Washington at whose hallowed grave we meet today. And as we recall the power of greatness that was evident in her son, let us thank God this power was guided and directed by a worthy mother whose very goodness and judgment inspired that greatness in the paths of honesty, virtue, patriotism, and wisdom. We call to President Jackson that Mary Washington was at once counsel, advisor, and companion to her son, a parent and a friend. At the outset of the French and Indian War, as a young officer in the Virginia militia, George Washington said goodbye to his mother. I've said my farewells to my sister and brothers. I shall miss them. And you, mother. Samuel was quite excited to learn that you were going north with General Bradder, George. Yes, I promised to write to him as often as possible. And how shall I write you, mother? Shall I protect you from the truth about the war? Shall I write as if I were off on a pleasure trip or a surveying expedition? What will be in your heart to write me, George? The truth. You have taught me to love the truth, to live it. Wherever we engage the French or the Indians, there will be danger. I would not willingly cause you worry 
but to gild over the stark details of battle would do a great disservice to your intelligence. Bless you, my son. If you had said other than that, I would feel that I had failed you. And so the letters came to Mary Washington. Letters from a son who regarded his mother as a companion intelligence, deserving of the truth she taught him. Months and years and battles passed, and Mary Washington witnessed the growth of her son until one day he stood before her, the commander-in-chief of the American forces in the War of Independence. Mother, I believe we've gathered most of your possessions together. The men and I will see that they are safely deposited at the Fredericksburg house. You speak with great authority, General. But I am not a member of your army. Suppose I refuse your command. In time of war, that amounts to treason. <laughs> even on the part of a civilian gentlewoman. <laughs> then shoot me, my son. Oh, Mother... <laughs> I really will leave a great part of me in this house. I know that, Mother. You were born here. And Betty, Samuel, John, Augustine, and Charles. It has been a good house, George. A happy home. And you may know its happiness again, Mother, once the war is over. But it's my turn to be selfish. I'll feel more peace at heart to know you're safe, nearer friends at Fredericksburg. Then so be it. Perhaps, perhaps the other side of the Rappahannock River is just as lovely. George. Yes, Mother. I am honored that you had the thought and took the time from the burden of your task to come here to see me settled and comfortable. I pray God that you are a good commander. God knows you are a good son. So Mary Washington moved across the river to Fredericksburg. There she kept her own house, worked its grounds, and moved faithfully to her son. Alone, she prayed for an early end of the war and his speedy return to his family. A model of brave dignity, Mary did much an example for the women of Virginia who had sent their men to war. Hours of spinning yet to do. No light to see by. Oh, December days are not long enough. Oh, well, tomorrow's another day. Well, no need to pound the door down. My hearing is still quite good, thank you. Mrs. Washington, I, I ran all the way from the newspaper office. Yes, well, come in. Come here by the fire. Warm yourself. Thank you. It is bitter cold out. Oh, bitter. But we know no cold as intense as the cold on the Delaware this night. Mrs. Washington, the general has crossed the Delaware. He took the Hessians by complete surprise, captured them by the hundreds, and killed their commander. And is George safe? Safe and victorious. We're preparing a special edition of the Express. Soon all Fredericksburg will know the brilliance of his strategy, his uncompromising bravery. His men... Were our losses heavy? Very light. All thanks to General Washington. The messenger back from the Delaware says his mastery over the enemy is unparalleled. That your son is the greatest commander in history. Thank God for his victory. That he and his men were spared. To the north, there is talk that we should set up a dynasty with the general at the head. Dynasty? Oh, sir, you forget yourself. Have we not had enough dynasty? Ah, but the general would be different. And if he would agree... Thank heaven he will not agree. No, I know my son well. He will not forget himself, though he is the subject of much praise. <laughs> and Mary Washington went back to her spinning, her weaving, her gardening, and her prayers. A mother always anxious, always prayerful, but always a model of strength and faith. An arbor in her garden became a daily spot of prayer and meditation for the venerable lady. Ye are the light of the world. 
A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. George. George. My son. I'm home, Mother. The war is over. Independence has been won. And I'm home. Oh, thank God. The struggle of man against men is over. The suffering of their women, too, is at an end. Oh. But you're tired, George. Bone tired and weary. I was tired, Mother. But at your side... I am young again. So young that I shall open the minuet at the victory ball this night at Fredericksburg. If only the lady of my choice will accompany me. Well, properly approached, I dare say the lady will accept. And uh, I do trust your minuet is a stately one, George. I'm I'm quite graceful myself. <laughs> <laughs> I shall be delighted, General Washington. Well, will not the others join us? I do not mind performing before my old friends at Fredericksburg. There are many here I do not recognize. Military uniforms, but I do not know. They are my comrades in arms, Mother. Officers of the French army. Behind me, standing near the orchestra, is my dear friend of whom I've written you, the Marquis de Lafayette. Striking man. And look, he bows to me. How very charming, George. Ah, uh, Monsieur de Marquis, she's a fine lady, is she not? Notable in many ways. The general tells me hers is an inspiring intellect, and she knows a great faith. I wonder how many in this great home realize how profoundly she has influenced her son. Ah, I do not know. But her son knows. And I think for his mother, that would be the important thing. When the victory ball was over, General Washington begged his mother to come to Mount Vernon and take up her residence with him there. But Mary Washington's reply surprised no one. I thank you for your dutiful and affectionate offers. But my wants are few in this life. And I feel perfectly competent to take care of myself. Such is the story of quiet greatness. The story of Mary Washington. It is of her that President Andrew Jackson makes these concluding remarks over her grave in her beloved Fredericksburg. Fellow citizens, at your request and in your name, I now deposit this plate in the spot destined for it. And when the American pilgrim shall, in after ages, come up to this high and holy place, and lay his hand upon this sacred column. May he record the virtues of her who sleeps beneath, and depart with his affections purified, and his piety strengthened, while he invokes his blessing upon Mary Washington. <laughs> Quiet street corner in Fredericksburg, 
Virginia, stands Mary Washington House, her last home. Also in that city is Mary Washington College, the women's division of the University of Virginia, named in memory of this great lady. This symbol of quiet greatness, this dominant example of inspiration, judgment, and faith. Now, I'll be back in a minute to tell you about next week's inspiring story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame and to introduce you to America's Mother of the Year. But first, here's my friend Frank Goss with some good advice about how to keep our friends. About how to keep our friends. In the 18th century, a famous English author named Sam should keep his friendships in constant repair. When you analyze it, that's pretty sound advice. For friendships which begin with mutual respect need a lot of thoughtfulness and care to keep them flourishing throughout the years. And you know, even though you don't have the leisure to visit your friends as often as folks did back in Mr. Johnson's day, there is one convenient way to remember them. I mean by sending Hallmark cards. At the fine stores where Hallmark cards are sold, you'll find ideal greetings for every special occasion. And you can choose Hallmark friendship cards too, cards that say, Hello there, I'm thinking of you today. What a glow of warmth and happiness those cards will bring, and what personal pleasure you'll take in selecting them. Yes, and there's something else to keep in mind. Each card you send will carry an extra measure of joy when the hallmark appears on the back, for it means you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. <laughs> well, Frank, uh, uh, speaking of friends, Today's the day we stop and pay tribute to the most unselfish, most giving, truest friend there is, our mother. And we are very honored indeed now to have you meet America's Mother of the Year, Mrs. Ethelyn Bott of Belleville, Illinois, a leader in her community, active in church and charitable and civic affairs, Mrs. Bott was chosen for this coveted honor because of her splendid fulfillment of all the qualifications of motherhood. Thank you, Mr. Barrymore. It is a great compliment to be singled out as the Mother of the Year, and I am very happy to have been so chosen. It is a great honor to represent on the Hallmark program the millions of other American mothers who are so proud of their own sons and daughters as the future men and women who will build America. Your dramatization of the life of Mary Washington was a moving tribute to mothers everywhere. And for them, I sincerely thank you. Well, our thanks and good wishes to you, Mrs. Ethelyn Bott. Like Mary Washington, you've made an exemplary contribution to family, community, and country for distinguished an already distinguished role, that of the American mother. Now, next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, we shall dramatize the unusual story of Frederick Tudor, the Ice King. Our Hallmark Hall of Fame is every Sunday. Our producer director is William Gay. Our script tonight was written by Kathleen Height. Until next Sunday, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Featured in our cast tonight were Lorene Tuttle as Mary Washington and Whitfield Connor as George. With Ted DeCorsia, Ben Wright, Polly Bear, Richard Beals, and John McGovern. Each Sunday, Hallmark Cards presents two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. The Hallmark Hall of Fame on radio with host Lionel Barrymore and on television with Miss Sarah Churchill. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who in their own way have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next Sunday, we honor Frederick Tudor on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC of Kansas City, Missouri.